Ladies, gentlemen, and those in between, it is the Deep Pride Podcast on a chilly Monday evening. I'm gathered around the fire and I'm toasting my socks off, so I'm quite happy. Joining me, as ever, is John Joe. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. And we have a special guest, Gareth Harahan. Now, who are you, Gareth? Who are you? What do you do? What's your thing? Uh, I'm Gareth Hanrahan. I'm a writer and game designer. Um, I've written lots of games and lots of books. <laughs> um, I've been working in the game industry for, at this point, more than 20 years, which is a terrifying revelation to me. Um, the most relevant for this conversation is that I'm uh, one of the two writers on the second edition of Trail of Cthulhu, which just wrapped up crowdfunding there uh, last Thursday. That's brilliant. And the I said the, the Kickstarter finished. Was it just uh, Thursday? And it did really well, actually. It did. We we made uh, one hundred eighty thousand in some currency. I think pounds. <laughs> Oh, 180. Well I mean, that is no small change. I mean, how many of your stretch goals did you break through? Uh, there were a few we left unbroken, but they may come out anyway. But there were <laughs> with like three bonus scenarios, various yeah. um, virtual tabletop bits, some extra monsters from Ken. Um, many monies. I'll, I'll be oh, and I'll, and I'll be waiting for a good while for the next few months. Yeah, it's, got, it's going to keep you busy. I mean, all those extra adventures that you've got to incorporate. I mean, at what stage in development did you do the Kickstarter? I mean, I know some companies literally write, develop the game and then do a Kickstarter. Others kind of just start, do it sort of midway through the process. Where do you kind of fit the Kickstarter? Well, I mean, it's, in? it's the second edition. So obviously we had the first edition text. And also we thought we were going to be Kickstarting last year. So we had the second edition, like 95% uh, done like uh, last year and this year we've just been tidying it up. So the manuscript is will still be edited and will be added to, but we we, we enter the, the back of it with a complete or a fairly complete manuscript. Although obviously extra stuff will be added in as a result of stretch goals. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's been a shift now from like kickstarted at the start of development to towards the end of development. Yeah, I mean, uh, the some of the I think I think the main issue is that some of the early kickstarters crashed and burned horribly. They did. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. so it's nice to be able to go to people look. We we have a thing, uh, like we kickstarted the Dracula dossier a few years ago, and similarly we went into that with a ninety percent complete manuscript, which became. About fifty percent complete after all the search goals for that. Yeah, I've, I've um, pl- uh, well, not played it, but I've read through the Jacket of Dust, and it's an amazing game. Really, is an amazing campaign. I mean, for Knights Black Agents, and yeah, massive fan of that whole kind. Of, it's almost like a sandbox campaign where Jacket is doing who's the, and you are, you know, free to, you know, pursue whatever goals you wish, and whatever t- strategy you wish. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, that was based off. Um, one of the key books for Trail of Cthulhu First Edition, which is Robin Laws' uh, Armitage Files, um, which t- did that the same, which sort of pioneered the whole, here, have a handout, that's your starting point. You can take the campaign in any direction, and you give the GM lots of support for doing that. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was ridiculous months of fun to write. <laughs> can I imagine? I mean, I mean, what was the drivers behind developing a second edition of uh, Trail of Cthulhu? Um, Partly, it's just it's been like what fifteen years since the first edition. It's sort of Pelgrane's well, our flagship gumshoe game. Um, so we were going to either do a just a straight reprint and like tweak it a bit, and we thought, hang on, we know we'll we'll take the time to polish it up. Um, I mean, the rules barely changed. We did a couple of minor tweaks, mostly in character creation, but the game is largely unchanged. It, it was working then; it works now. The other reason to do a second edition was that in Trail of Cthulhu, we had three campaign frames. Um, there was the Armitage Inquiry still in there. And first edition, there was Bookhounds of London and Project Covenant, which were basically sample ways to play. And Project Covenant became a book on its own, or sorry, Bookhounds of London became a book on its own, the Bookhounds of London book. Um, Project Covenant sort of led into uh, us doing Fall of Delta Green. So we like you know, wanted to do 
something to replace those because they had their own products. So we came up with new campaign frames. Uh, also, we really wanted to do a new starter scenario because the scenario, as as we pointed out many times, the scenario in the back of the first edition trail book is a great scenario, but it's definitely not a starter scenario for UGMs. Yeah. So it sounds like almost a consolidation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everything that you've done before. I mean, anytime you're doing a second edition, at this point I've done lots of them, you're either sort of curating what's there and going, okay, people like this, it's it's working, we should like, you know, keep the parts that work and tweak it a bit. Or you're going, okay, people have played it and they've identified something that needs like that everyone agrees needs to be changed needs to be changed. Or you're coming back to something after many, many years and going, right, I'm going to like you know, put my own stamp on it. But that wasn't the case here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Call of Cthulhu, it'd be fair to say, is the beam off in the horror and Lovecraft oh, um role playing games for you. What does Trail of Cthulhu do differently? Um but part of the initial success of Trail First Edition was that it was coming in at a time when Call was sort of on one of its downswings. That's yeah. definitely not the case these days. Kelsey has done a great job, sort of uh, not rebooting, but like you know, do, like get, get, getting Cthulhu books out. Yeah. Um, so I guess our unique selling points, to use a marketing term, would a be the Gumshoe system, which is basically a design from the ground up for investigation. So it's it's very much aimed at the sort of sub-genre of Lovecraftian gaming where you're solving mysteries, where you're expected to actually um, work out what's going on as opposed to just like, you know, have horrible things happen to you and go mad and die, which is another way to play it. Um, the other unique selling point uh, is unfortunately not here tonight, and that's Ken Height. And Ken is, as many books have pointed out, a freaking genius, and he knows Lovecraft inside out and in various non-Euclidean ways. Um, so we've basically taken a sort of what's called ho- like holographic approach to the mythos, where we don't say this is what Cthulhu is. We'll offer like you know ten different interpretations of the various monsters, lots of ways for the GMs to basically make make this their own, and lots of ways to basically surprise the players. Because the one downside of Trail being so, or sorry, of Call being so well known and so established is that like you know like the players go into a basement and the GM goes, oh, there's a puddle there. And half the players go, aha, puddles, deep ones, fish monsters. Whereas if we t- you take a more sort of holistic approach and have lots of options for the various creatures, then the players don't know what's going on. You've got the mystery back, you've got the horror of the unknown back. Yeah, because I mean, when they describe the monsters, in, you know what to say. But if you read the original Lovecraft stories, he doesn't describe them. He rarely describes the monsters, or usually kind of fa- focuses on one specific part of I mean, it is usually the description is the reaction the yeah. protagonists have to the monsters or he'll mm. give like you know, a bunch of contradictory descriptions or he'll yeah. like you know hint at one bit hint at another bit hint at another bit you know, you've got to put them all together but i mean the, the whole idea of lovecraft coming up with his own monsters back in the day was that he felt that like werewolves and vampires were sort of wrung out and tired he wanted to create new horrors and the irony is that because lovecraftian gaming has gone on so long They've also been like you know, Roy Osher become tired, and you've got to rejuvenate them or create new things. Mm. Yeah, the, you need to add that mystery back because that's what's essential to Lovecraft the Unknown. And when you kind of got the stats for Cthulhu and know what it looks like, it's not very unknown. Yeah, so you have to basically take Cthulhu and, as Kemal put it, by associate him and like you know, add in new elements or take take the existing things and merge it with other strange stuff. Yeah. And we give lots of tools in there for doing just that. What's the survivability of a, of a player character in Trail of Cthulhu? Um, moderate. I mean, you're relatively resilient. In t- like, you won't get ki- like, generally okay. Yeah, obviously it's Cthulhu game, so yeah, there can be situations where. You like you know, if if you were up and attack the shot and like you know, punch the shot off, you'll get eaten. Um, but because the game has a fairly narrow range of damage, basically it's d6 plus modifier, and you gen you are not killed until you're at minus twelve. Uh, you won't get like you know, randomly taken out by one hit. So like your best games are sort of there's like you know, sort of appropriately tough. Like you 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 won't get killed instantly by bad roll. But you can't take more than like two or three hits before you're in trouble. Um, mm-hmm. Similarly, the sanity system, 
it's not like uh, where it's where like your one roll can instantly break your mind. Um, there's a, it's more of a sort of a slow decline, um, but it gets precipitously fast if you're making bad decisions or in a bad situation. Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so slightly more resilience, but one or two hit and you're gonna feel it basically. Yeah. And the other thing is that because Trail uses uh, uh, point spend systems, where basically you have a pool of stability, a pool of health, mm. which is whittled away over the course of the game. Even if you're taking like minor hits, like losing a small bit of, san- of sanity or small hit points, you're not getting it back very quickly. Um, so you're, you're, you're declining over the course of the game in yeah. pretty much every possible way. Okay, that, that sounds really cool. So, that, like I said, it's still got like look like a horror game still has a bite to it. Yeah, but you're not going to be you know out of, out of the game after you know one or two encounters yeah. that go badly for you. It's a it's a death spiral as opposed to a sudden ah I rolled badly I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, I and mean, that was always one of the problems. Like some horror games, like how do you have the kind of the threat, mm-hmm. but still make it playable for characters? Indeed. And the other traditional problem was like, you know, oh no, my character has died. It takes me ages to make a new one versus their like, you know, relatively short lifespan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what's the character creation like in Trill of Cthulhu? I mean, because that's always the first thing players ask. Um, we've changed it for the second edition. The first edition was a bit more math heavy. Second edition, basically you pick a template, which is like, you know, your classic uh, Cthulhu invested careers, your detective, your professor, your Dilettante, you're a cultist, you're antiquarian, all those heroic antiquarians. Uh, that gives you a certain number of points. You've got two types of abilities. You've got investigative abilities and general abilities. Uh, the core idea of Gumshoe is that it's always more fun for the players to get information, to get the clues. So your investigative abilities always work. You never need to roll for them. You just, if you have the right ability, use the right case, you get the information. General abilities you actually roll for, you spend points for that ability. Roll D6, trying to beat a target number. So that whatever template you pick gives you a certain number of best in general. You then have a bunch more points to spend based on the number of players in the group. So if you have like you know lots lots of players, you get fewer best abilities each because it's spread amongst the group. Yeah. If you only have one or two players, you get a big bunch of, of these abilities, and you basically stick points into your pools. Um, it's like very simple uh, character creation. I like the fact that the number of points you get is dependent upon the player size, because that's one of the big things. I mean, if you all got the same number of points, regardless of how many there are in the group, mm-hmm. then that massively increases the um, team's you know damage output effectively. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you are investigative input. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we, you basically calibrate the number of investigative points based on the number of regular players you have. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are all, there's a couple of other like, small mechanics of character creation, like you pick your drive, which is the reason your character is an investigator. It's what like drives literally drives you into solving mysteries. You pick your source of stability, which are people you know, and you can basically go talk to them and get some emotional reassurance, get some stability back. And your pillars of sanity, which are the things your character fundamentally believes about the universe to be true, which unfortunately in a Cthulhu game <laughs> rapidly proved to be not true that all of human existence is just a hollow lie and there's nothing but the screaming of Azathoth in the void. <laughs> and so say we all. Exactly. Um, one thing I would ask is, like, you know, typically a Mifos story is set in the 1920s, 1930s. <laughs> now, but it's kind of, there's more recent stories based on Lovecraft, which can be set in one day. I'm thinking, for example, Providence by uh, Alan Moore. Mm-hmm. Where does Trader Cthulhu sit in this? Uh, our default setting is the 1930s. Yeah. Um, it's a, a a more desperate decade. You've got the uh, World War II brewing. You've got the uh, Anan Urbe, the Nazi occultists running around the place. Uh, you've got the Great Depression, which creates lots of social upheaval in the States. So basically you're out of Lovecraft's Roaring Twenties into a more unpleasant time. Uh, that said... Um, we are going to be doing uh, modern day rules as well. We've got a bunch of scenarios set in different time periods. Um, one of my favorite ones is Bill White's, what's called the Big Hoodoo, I think it's called, where the pre gen character, it's set in the 60s, and the pre gen characters are people like uh, I think Aldous Huxley's in there. And, oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Um, oh, 
Um, who are the other ones? It's, it's all basically sort of the 60s countercultural people. It's great. Oh, nice. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the system is re- is very easy to port to different time periods. You, you just need to, to work out what investigative abilities are appropriate for that era. Yeah, I mean, I think that one one big difference when you set something in the modern day is the ubiquitousness of modern technologies. In particular, I'm thinking of phones, smartphones, because as soon as you got a smartphone in someone's hand, they've got access to a lot of information, mm-hmm. and we're communicating with each other, and just about every gadget under the sun. Yep. Mm. But uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the thirties is lovely setting for that because you're like you're you're you're, yeah. you're depriving them of technology. But I mean, we we like Night Spec Agents is just to zoom back to that is set yeah. the modern day. Have all the gadgets you want. The the, the bad guys have them too. That's true. Um, yeah, you'll be tracked by your phone. <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean, well, I said I said, I said um, over Halloween I ran a horror game of Shiver um, at the local game store, Board and Sword Hobbies, and I said it on Monday and using. And basically what I did was I set in this one building, which was a secure facility, evidence storage, and it just happened to make it a Faraday cage. <laughs> so suddenly everyone's phones stopped working and all the radios don't connect to each other. And, oh, we can't talk to the outside world and the shutters have come down. So at that point, I just kind of isolated them both physically and connect- connectively. Mm-hmm. And that worked very well. Uh, I would say in this modern day, if you did that to some to a group of people, the first thing you'd be hearing is someone in the distance going, "We're all gonna die!" and then <laughs> it all just goes into panicking mayhem. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, do you know what? Even like just from today, I, you know, you see people walking around and somehow they're texting on their phone, they're like like that, but you know, they're they're walking and some of them have got some good perception. They are still able to avoid people and duck and dive and i think it's it's a it's crazy if you take that phone away from them are they going to be worse in their direction are they going to walk into walls without their phone it's it's, it's frightening it's frightening frightening in the world yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was reading an article there about the decline of map reading because everyone's so used to using google maps and everything yeah. But, yeah yeah that's another one yeah Indeed. well yeah it's um well I, because i we live out in the countryside um we do kind of t- take the kids out on a map reading or interiorring day and just go, right, okay, we're going to go here, here, here. Don't leave the phone behind. Leave the phone behind. Well, all you start in our pockets and just use an OS map mm. and see how much we can get lost and make our way back. <laughs> or just like a really long piece of string. Um, <laughs> that works as well. One of my favourite maps is this map that showed like great-grandparents, grandparents, like our generation and kids, and show yeah. the, the range they went on. Like, you know, the, like, you know kids, like, you know, tidal area, next generation up, slightly bigger area that they were, like, allowed to play in. And they get back to the, mm-hmm. the, like, the great grandparents, and they're like, you know, oh, yeah, he went off, like, you know, 10 miles down the road on his bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, I don't know what's, yes, yeah, it's massively changed. I don't know how far, I mean, I've got three children, so. And and I do security, so that makes me paranoid when it comes <laughs> to technology. And it's yeah, it's interesting just how far we can let them wander. The older they get, we do kind of let them wander for a film. My sixteen, my sixteen year old now is yep. Yeah, you want to go anywhere? Fine, just you got your phone. I can follow you in Google Maps and know where you are. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, it's yeah. With I mean, technology. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right, no, but I mean, um... how how did you find? It's a piece of technology, actually. How did you find? gaming during covid lockdowns how did that kind of impact you in your life oh it was very very disastrous i discovered that i gm with my hands yeah uh, i was trying to run a game yeah i was traveler i was going like you know, okay your spaceship's here and you're docking here and the players just weren't getting the geometry <laughs> of it I, I got very very frustrated so yeah um my gaming suffered a lot during covid i'm very glad to be back in in real space again um it, yeah we it, it, the change in gaming in general in the last five years is just astounding both like online play um actual plays on on youtube but like my, my kids they're like going to secondary school like our high school in a year or two so we went around to all the open nights there uh, a few weeks ago 
like the various schools of the area, and all of them were praising their D and D group as like you mm. know a here's a reason to go to our school. We have a very active D and D group. <laughs> okay, it was, it was just so bizarre that like you know like these like you know educational professionals were like highlighting what in my head was like an obscure hobby a few years ago as like you know, the cool thing to be doing. Yeah. Well, I think there's two drives behind that. One is D and D became massively popular in March, April, 2020. Yeah. Because people were looking for something to do online, and D and it just turned out D and D came to the fore. Yeah. Uh, Roll twenty, like I think I think it was Roll twenty. Um, their user base increased tenfold. It yeah. just skyrocketed to the point where they were having to hire new stuff to kind of yeah. help and like you know get more service space for Amazon or. Whatever their cloud providers were, to just, just to have the resources capable to to do that, mm. and like I say, I mean, I spoke to the brand manager of D and D at Hasbro, and they said, yeah, it just skyrocketed, mm-hmm. and I think that a lot of that is basically people wanted to do something online, and it wasn't just existing players of D and D and gaming, but new people wanting to well I, I can't go out of the house what can i do okay i'll role play going out of my house yeah and also <laughs> it, there's a sort of a positive feedback loop where beca- as more people play it becomes less of the nerdy geeky thing the weird kids do and more this like you know generally accessible hobby and plus you had this like general explosion of fantasy like after the other rings movies and game of thrones and so forth and mm. fantasy just became a much more but- less niche thing I think D and D sort of picked up as well after Stranger Things as well because yeah. I think um, that probably put it into a more mainstream market as well. So uh, and Pete, you, you know I've still not played D and D. I will play D and D one day. I promise I will. I am <laughs> guaranteeing I will. I need. I need to. I need. I need some better friends. Um, <laughs> yeah. Pete, you're t- playing to us most of the. Like, yeah, that's the, actually that was one thing with Stranger Things. It showed the playing of D and D. It wasn't like you know. D and D is weird hobby where you dress up and like you know, wave a sword around the woods or whatever. People saw, oh, hang on, it's around a table. It's actually fairly simple. Because mm-hmm. I mean, the, the the trick for any role playing game back in the day was like you, you'd always just like have someone show you how to role play, because it's very hard to describe in a book how like, the act of role playing. But video just makes it all like you. Oh, what's role playing? It's like, oh yeah, that's it. You see, like you know, the the the, the conversation at the table and how how the GM and the players interact. Yeah, it's um, like I think just like having the videos, like you know, the actual plays of um, you know Critical Role, uh, Ellie by Night, even Geek Pride's um, Legend of Our Sacrifice. It just shows this is what D and D is, mm-hmm. without you know, by and just purely by demonstrating it, people instantly understand. Oh right, okay, it's basically. You know, free form amateur dramatics with a bit of um, nerd jokes for an infant good yeah, measure. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've written about it a few times for various outlets. And I think also one of the other drivers as well is, you know, people well, like ourselves grew up playing D&D. Mm-hmm. And now we, we kind of, you know, matured, sort of, into adults. Kind of, technically, and we kind of purposes. We kind of interested our children to it, mm-hmm. and we you know basically it's we share it as yeah. like in positions of authority. I mean, um, Professor David Waldron uh, is this Australian um, anthropology and history professor in Australia, and he uses uh, role playing games, actual plays, element of LARP in his teachings, and is is like the um, outlets and uh, outreach programs yeah. to kind of d- to teach hi- to teach history, mm-hmm. and it's like they'll give it a new a new way of sharing history with others in a rather than just speaking and telling. They kind of immerse themselves in the history. Yeah, you know, the, the, the role play is fantastic for that. Like you, you, even when you're doing like you know um, like where, 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 uh, trail scenarios, just to <laughs> vaguely gesture in the, in the direction of the actual topic. Um, like you, you, you can read like all the history books you want, but then you actually write a scenario. And go, okay, the characters are on a train. Did they have like you know, the, the, were they dining cars back then? Where was there like a little tea cart that came down? You look into aspects of history that 
like there will be out there in this in the material somewhere but it's not like you know reading a linear history of the of like life in the 30s you, you it, it creates questions you've got, you've got to go and answer so you you end up like research those obscure things and being prompted to do stuff you wouldn't normally do to get a much yeah. more you know, a much more much broader look into a period or a topic I find a lot of games now, and imagine this is the same for Trailer Cthulhu, it's like, they have a section and it's basically, what is life like in the setting? Mm-hmm. What is the everyday life like? Like, how, what do people watch? What do they do for a living? What do they eat? Yeah. And they're kind of setting that baseline of a typical life, then kind of like builds out from there, like, you no know, from okay, this is how it's different. Yeah, we have a chapter in there on the second thirties, and like you. Know, but again, that's like you. Know, it's not just like you know, a history of the events. It's like you know, what was life like? What like you know, what, what 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 would your characters have like you know, have been doing? What, what movies were there? What music? Uh, what was various like you know, like the like the politics of the world and so forth. But again, mm. um, it's start it's starting point because you obviously we we expect players to go to, and GMs to go off and do the research because the research is. The fun bit with investigative games. Yeah, cause, but, yeah, but you, still, you still need to kind of set that baseline so yeah. you can just kind of reflect in the text like, okay, this is what happens normally. This is what's abnormal. Mm-hmm. And you kind of focus, because you kind of have to extrude it out from there to kind of like set that initial kind of pattern of disconcertion and hang on, something's not quite right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so much Lovecraft stories are about like, you know, him very, very, very carefully going through the history, go, like you know, setting up all the like the stuff that actually happened, and then having this one little twist, which is the door to the horror. Yeah. Um, what, what's your favourite Lovecraft story? Ooh, uh, I'm a big, big fan of Dreams in the Witch House. Oh yeah. Um, purely because it's just so strange. I mean, it's, it's barely a story in a lot of ways. Like you know, man goes to room, room bad things happen. <laughs> <laughs> man, man has nervous breakdown, gets heart eaten. Um, like even for Lovecraft, it is much more a mood piece. But the 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 one bit that I, I always think of is this bit where he feels this weird tugging, and he realizes that he's drawn towards a particular point in the sky. And and as the day goes on, the point moves. I realize that he's been drawn towards a star, and it's, it, it, it is just so weird and. I mean, it has no real effect on the story. It's, it's not like this like, moment of revelation. It's just this weird bit, uh, but always haunts me. I mean, Call of Cthulhu is fantastic. Um, Shadow of Rinsmouth is just this. That is, yeah, that's, I mean, that's one of the people that, one that everyone goes to, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sh- Shadow is, is just this quintessential adventure game where you, yeah. the character goes in, does some investigating, finds out the weirdness, get some backstory and then there's an action scene and then there's the twist at the end yeah i mean it has all the kind of standard tropes for this country you know you the the, the, it's the outsider going into this new set setting things a bit different and the revelation and yeah the conclusion yeah actually one bit we included in the second edition of trail He's basically we've got this basically encyclopedia of mythos tropes where like you you have like all those elements like you know the the ruined town the the various plot hooks the various twists Lovecraft uses I'm going okay here are basically the ingredients here's how to mix them into a scenario of your own that's nice so like basically you kind of you kind of step again establishing the baseline over like a typical yeah Lovecraft scenario exactly I mean, um there's been a lot of like oh, Lovecraft stories, but also a lot of writers inspired by Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. Um, like, for example, Richard, um, is it Richard Lehman? Richard Lehman did a few. Um, the author of Next Got Novel, Brian Lumley as well, Brian did Lumley. a few. Yeah. Do you kind of incorporate sort of like the wider uh, Lovecraft, Lovecraftian stories, want to have a better term? Um, th- we're doing some stuff. Um, Basically, we're in the our our, our life is through Chaosium, so and Chaosium have access to Brian Lumley stuff and Ramsey Campbell stuff and mm. various other writers. So in the core book, it is just uh, the original Lovecraft material. We're 
Um, Ken's doing a PDF with some extra, um, I think mainly Campbell Drive stuff. Um, so we're certainly at the core, we're sort of hyper hyper focused on uh, Lovecraft at his circle back in the twenties. A good bit of um, material from Howard there, but we have we have like done stuff with other involving other writers, and there's more to come on that side. But that's not for me to announce. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, like, also, like, a lot of different writers have a slightly different take or approach, I think it's the best way I can describe, to the Lovecraft story. I mean, Brian Dumbly once again, we said, yeah, my guys fight back. Indeed, his tightest crow was, like, was Doctor Who. Exactly, Hoover, Hoover, yes. Hardest, yes. My very, to, to my shame, when I, my very first interaction on the internet, back in 1996. Yeah was ha- having a flame war with Brian Lumley. It was a very... very okay, you had to tell me about this flame war. <sighs> it was literally my first week on the internet. <laughs> I'd gone to college, first time, first time I had access to Usenet. This yeah. Old horror Cthulhu back in the day. Yeah. I had gotten into, like, Lovecraftian and stuff only a, a year or two before. Picked up the Titus Crow books. Read them. Wrote this, like, you know, very angry, not, not angry, but like, you know, sarcastic yeah. post on Altar Cthulhu. And Brian Lumley saw it and uh, was uh, unimpressed and, <laughs> and replied. What did he say? Um, but the main thing I remember, like but now and then the handle I use everywhere on the internet is Mytholder. Yeah. And... Uh, he called me, if I remember correctly, Myth Toddler. <laughs> <laughs> and I suspect that encouraged you to respond. I think I was too scared. I mean, it was literally like... Yeah. <laughs> and plus, a response would take about a week back then on the internet. It's true. It, 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 <laughs> it was early, or not, not, not early used that, but it was like the late period used that, but yeah. back mm. in the 90s. But yes, I, I, I've been very respectfully interested since then, having learned, learned my lesson from day one. Did you ever meet um, Brian Lumley afterwards? I, no. And no. I, I hope... I hope is, he, is he still alive, he is, isn't he? Where is he? I'd say. Is he still alive? No. I no, he died no, at the beginning of this year. Yeah, 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 he did. Yeah, no, so I, I never did. I will never have a chance to apologise. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're a fan of um, Lovecraft, uh, from many years. How did you get into game design? Um, sort of actually through, well, um, through, well, indirectly through Lovecraft. Basically, um, there's a local convention here, WarpCon, and uh, I got involved in writing scenarios for that. And because we inherited a weird system for the RPGA where basically one person writes a scenario and then multiple tables run it. So like, yeah. um, more sort of tournament style, which isn't, use that off these days and is also really inefficient in many ways. Um, but I, So I wrote these scenarios and I wrote them up in sufficient detail for other people to run them. So I started putting them up online and that led into um, the offers of freelance work because basically I wrote up a couple of Blue Planet scenarios and the guys who were publishing Blue Planet went, oh, do you want to write some stuff for us? Uh, so then I was doing freelance writing for various people. And then my real world computer job went away and I went, oh, I should like, you know, get a new job. But I had three months salary saved up. So I thought, oh, I'll see how long freelancing will last. And uh, it has lasted 20 plus years, as I said. <laughs> so, yeah, it it's was very how, accidental. It's weird how a lot of freelancers sort of do kind of just it's never just kind of like shift over straight away. It's kind of there's something to do in the background for a bit. Then something happens in their conventional day job. And then just realize, I don't need that conventional day job because I could do freelancing instead full time. Well, I mean, in, in my case, certainly it wasn't that I like you know, planned, aha, I could do freelancing full time. Yeah. It was, I'll see how long it lasts. I mean, I don't think I would have made the transition willingly, <laughs> the, the courage to do so. Uh, but I mean, who knows? Maybe I've gotten very, very bored to computers. I certainly was. <laughs> what are you doing in computers, by the way? You don't want to know. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it was like, you know, graphical user interfaces for network attached storage. Okay, so, so GUI systems and, yeah. 
I think, again, 20 years ago, wasn't any good at us. <laughs> really? <laughs> and, like I say, you've also written um, some stories as well, some books. Yeah. Um, uh, I have what, uh, yeah, five, five novels out at the moment from Orbit Books. Oh, nice. Uh, sixth one is out in May, and I'm waiting to sign a contract for seventh and eighth. Um, but yeah, I um, wanted to see if, try my hand at doing actual fiction as opposed to gaming stuff, and uh, it happened. So I've got uh, one series, the Black Iron Books, which are sort of weird steampunk-esque or alchemy punk uh, fantasy horror with wax monsters and tentacled things and worm people and uh, angry mad gods. And the other books, uh, The Lands of the Firstborn, are Tolkien-inspired. Uh, I'm a big Tolkien fan. I'm writing lots of stuff for the One Ring role-playing game as well. Um, Moria just came out at Gen Con. Oh, nice. Sorry, I'll actually put the map up there on the wall. Oh, that's nice. That was very basic, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so there's a line in the intro to Lord of the Rings where Tolkien goes, uh, the War of the Ring doesn't follow the real war. If it did, then Barajo would not have been destroyed, but occupied. And I went, oh, that's a really good idea. So the, st- the, that's the firstborn book start off with basically this bunch of heroes take down the Dark Lord and then occupy his city of evil. And the initial thing is basically them trying to basically run, like basically run Mordor. That sounds. I mean, did you put? It sounds comedy to me. That that could be great as a comedy or a horror or both. It tends more towards the horror end, or certainly the like you know. Okay, the the, the two spaces were that, and also the American occupation of Iraq and the attempts at nation building. Oh wow! Because <laughs> it all goes very badly wrong. Yeah, I could imagine that. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. I mean, um, one thing I found, like, look, when I've done my fiction writing, it's vastly different to my journalism. Mm-hmm. Journalism is very concise. You know, you have literally a thousand words maximum. Mm-hmm. And so you learn to kind of write in a very concise, very sort of prescriptive way. Yeah. Fiction is very different. Mm-hmm. It's very, you know, expansive, very, you know, descriptive. Is that the same between the you and game writing and fiction writing? I think game writing and fiction writing are closer than like game writing and journalism. Yeah. Um, because they're both in both cases, a large chunk of it is just inter- is writing entertaining prose. Like you know, mm. it's you, people read this for pleasure. It's not they they're, they're not trying to learn something per se. So like, you, you you can be more descriptive. You can just like wander off on tangents a bit. Like even when you're writing rules, you want to have a bit of humor in there or a bit of a few sides to keep the person's attention. Um, the big difference, or the two big differences I found are one, game writing, it's functional. You're, you're, you're trying to basically give the GM material they can use, um, which means, often means breaking down information. I mean, like you know, having like if then, having sort of useful stuff they can drop in and out, whereas obviously fiction needs to be flowing prose. The other thing that kept tripping up for a long time was I could come up with these elaborate plots, these elaborate settings, and then I'd go, right, what do the players do? Which is ideal in a role-playing game, not great in a novel. So yeah. my sort of breakthrough in novel writing was coming with a character who was ridiculously impulsive, who basically, like, you know, as soon as there was the faintest hint of a plot hook, she just jumped at it without any forethought. Um, so that gave me sort of like enough narrative propulsion to write the first novel. And after that, I got better at doing characters. Yeah, trying to create adventures for players is always challenging, especially when you don't know the players. Because when, you don't, when, you, when you've got a regular group, you can just kind of guess how they're going to react and kind of mm-hmm. set up the appropriate, you know, um, tropes to kind of engage them. But with, play, you know, when you write an adventure for unknown players... You can't don't have that initial engagement. No, well, what you can do are uh, you can either have a whole bunch of possible hooks in and like let the GM pick the one that works best. You can do advice on basically like, adapting the adventure for that group. Um, what Trail does, which is really handy in logical games, do is you've got drives where basically you have like you know 
you won't necessarily know who the players are, but you know that they have picked from this list a of, of reasons to get involved. Yeah, and like, you know, okay, I know that like, you know, that drives and stuff like, you know, curiosity or desire for revenge. So, okay, I can plug those into the scenario and have like, you know, opportunities to use those. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, what I find with scenarios as well is that you can predict about, like there'd be one course of action that about like, you know, 60 or 70% of players will do, like, you know, they'll do the semi-obvious thing. You can put, you can guess the other like the weird things that about twenty percent will do, and there's another twenty or thirty which you'll never guess, and then all you can do is like give the GM like you know tools for handling unexpected stuff or things they can drop in or like you know insight into how the NPCs might react to unexpected stuff. Um, you can't cover every scenario; you can only cover the most likely ones, but you can make things as robust as possible. Yeah, it's always a case of like you can plan as much as you can. Mm-hmm. But you always have to be flexible. There's always going to be one player that's going to be something that you just could not anticipate. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's part that's both the joy and terror of role-playing, right? It's great when you're actually at, at the table. I mean, I, there's nothing I love more than running a game at a con where you've got like, you know, six players I don't know. I don't know how they're going to surprise me. And try to stay ahead of them and like, you know, work out, okay, what sort of players are these? Like, you know, what might they do? Will they like you know, follow, follow the, the, my likely plot hooks, or will they do something unexpected? Um, but it's terrifying when you're not, not terrifying, but it's like you know, it's it's tricky when you're writing for them because you're trying to cover like you know, as much as you can, while still giving the GM not like a clear idea of what's going on, while also being entertaining and while also keeping it within word count. So there's a lot of trade-offs to be made. It's it's ju- it's a bit like spinning different plates at the same yeah. time and trying Absolutely. to keep them all balanced. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of my fit like. The one best memories is when I was running a game of the Battletech role-playing game. And they kind of ha- they had to go somewhere and do something within a space of four weeks. But they had various options of what they could do. And it's kind of basically left them to it. So like, they're basically like, you do what you want. Yeah. And I just really sat back and just watched them debate for an hour amongst <laughs> themselves. Because, well, okay, that'll take an hour, but know, if you do this, that'll take two weeks. But And it was just great because like, I'd done all the prep work. And I basically had to answer questions. Yeah, and it was this is great. I should do this more often. Although to be said, my my, my worst experience GMing was also playing Battletech role playing game. Um, I wrote up the scenario where the character is supposed to go after this base, and I set the space with like lots of hidden mechs and minefields and mm. traps and so forth. And the, the, okay, just for context, we, we were about fourteen at this point, so this is like you know, <laughs> even before it was in Flame Wars with Brian Lumley. <laughs> Uh, so I printed the scenario out and sat down at the table to run it. And first player takes his mech, moves forward, steps to the side, moves forward again, carefully avoiding the minefield right in front of him. I go, oh, that was an odd move, but like, you know, he, he was quite lucky to avoid that minefield. Yep. Next player jumps over the minefield, goes, okay, I'm going to fire my LRMs at that empty hex there. <laughs> I go, okay. And he fires and hits the hidden mech I had buried in that hex. He, he wasn't supposed <laughs> to go about it. I go, that's a very odd move for the player. I didn't work out that they had found the printed out scenario and had copies of it <laughs> until they started correcting me on how much damage the uh, fuel tank explosion did. <laughs> ah, so they, they did counter espionage. They did like real, real life country espionage by taking my scenario off my printer, photocopying it, and had to get cheap notes. As That's I said, we were, we were fourteen, and I have for, forgiven most of them. Most of them. Yeah, Dara, if you're watching, I still haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, it's amazing as well, like the, the friendships we we form when we when we gaming is incredibly strong. Like, oh, but I'm still I'm still friends like the, the game with uh, the people I played with back when I was 14. Yeah, me too. And I don't think there's many other hobbies where you build a strong friendships as you do. Well, the great thing about gaming, it evolves with you. I mean, yeah. like we were playing those like, you know, silly Battletech games back when we were 14. We sort of went through our teenage years playing Vampire. And like, you know... <laughs> 
you can like you know D and D can either be a beer and pretzel dungeon crawl where you're just like playing as a hero quest like rolling dice, or you can do these elaborate political stuff, or you could do all that and then you can be in your forties with kids and be very tired and go back to the beer and pretzel stuff because it's just a, a reason to hang around. I mean, I think like one reason D and D took off in the pandemic, as we discussed earlier, was because you want an activity to do with people. Like you, know, I remember those all remember those awkward Zoom calls in the pandemic where all your friends would meet up. I go, "How are you? Fine. I news. No, we're all locked inside." And either you end up discussing, like you know, how you're sanitizing your groceries, <laughs> or you go, "Hang on, we could actually, like you, know, add something new. We can play a game." Yeah, it's that like it's a, the shared virtual experience. I think also that, um, especially in the lockdown, it becomes a platform for conversation. Mm-hmm. Basically, you're playing a game between each other, but then that acts as like the convers like the, a baseline for which you just start talking with each other, generally yeah. talking about things that matter to you. Mm-hmm. And I found that especially, most notably, especially when we found a table. Obviously, that wasn't possible during lockdown, yeah. but I know afterwards, where and before as well, equally. To, you know, we'd be sitting around a table. One player would be saying, "Oh, well, my character does this," and the others, the GM would be kind of narrating it. But the others would be, you know, combination of snark, commentary, or just chatting amongst themselves. Yeah. And they're building that bond. And like I say, you don't get that elsewhere. No, I, I also like just the physical act of sitting around a table, sharing food, sharing yeah. drinks, sharing time. I mean, that's like absolutely primal. Oh well, yeah, I mean, when people say like role play is a new hobby. It isn't. We've been. It's a storytelling. It's a collaborative storytelling, yeah. which we've been doing since the time of cavemen and uh, sitting around a uh, campfire telling stories. It's a very, as you yeah. say, like primal, primitive experience that we just keep getting. And it's, it. it's got gambling, which is the other thing, because <laughs> like, I mean. Like, uh, reading history books, the one thing everyone seems to do is gambling. Yeah. Because, like, you know, it was easy entertainment. And, like, role-playing does have the thrill of uncertainty. We've got both, both narratively, where you've got, like, you know, the players come up with stuff you can't predict. But also, it's like, dice rolling is fun. It is. Yeah. I mean, even when, you know, you aren't rolling for anything, you just start, you just, you just, just roll dice almost instinctively. Yeah. And they have that ritual of, like, oh, right, I need this roll, I need these sixes, don't let me yeah. down. And it's almost kind of... Via, you know, theatrical ritual element to it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you, you can even have games that emphasise that. Like, um, have you read uh, Die, Kieran Gillen's? No. Oh, it's really good. Basically, basically the, the gimmick of Die is you come up with a group of players as you're playing a gaming group mm-hmm. who then get dragged into the fantasy world of their game. Oh, nice. And it's... But like many, many metal levels, and part of the fun is coming up with like you know the most dysfunctional, broken down gaming groups, <laughs> and then drag the old fantasy world. But he like you know, breaks it down into like you know rituals for beginning and ending play. The whole idea of there's like so the, the, the magic circle in the sacred space, which is what gaming is. I do like those kind of those metatextual elements mm-hmm. in role where you kind of kind of almost cross that divide between the real and the imaginary and kind of it's no longer as liminal space as it once was yeah. there's almost like a great attachment um i mean w- one of the things i like to do like obviously you know D, um the warlock rather than having the the, the warlock's patron as some sort of nebulous being i like to think of it it's either the player character in the future yeah. telling the the that play character what to do, or the the patron is the player, <laughs> and basically just have this come really kind of like okay, my patron is this guy called Pete. <laughs> have you heard and, of James Wallace's Frupp? Which is ones? James Wallace's Frupp game. No, Frupp no. is an absolute work of genius. We have been tr- which James has been promised to publish for many many years and. So let's get around to doing so. The gimmick of Frupp is there's this fantasy world. And then one day, God drops three holy books from the heavens. They land. And these contain basically the, the laws of the world, how to have a good life. Yeah. And the holy books are the player's handbook, 
the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Monster Manual. <laughs> oh, that's great. And basically, it turns to paranoia because obviously, if you're not playing by the rules, you're a heretic and should be burned at the stake. So if the, if you, if you roll your random class and you're a fighter, then you should be up there in the front hitting things, even if you are like you know, a like you know, six stone weakling. And if the game says you're you're a wizard, then you better be able to cast spells or pretend to cast spells. <laughs> that is brilliant. Indeed. Oh, and is, has it been, is it, is, you said it's not been published yet? Uh, no, he, he came up with the idea back in like the 90s and has been re- refining it and redoing it ever since. He must publish it now. I want to play that game. Indeed. Yeah. And I mean, well, well, back to Trailer Cthulhu. Excellent. <laughs> This is this is typical of our conversation. Yeah, we start no. going off in tangents. Is um, obviously you've done the Kickstarter now. Mm-hmm. What's the kind of the um plan for the next? Well, for next year, really. I think. Um, as far as I know, it'll be going up for pre-order by the end of the month. So if oh, you miss okay. the back stick backer kit, then you can still jump in and pre-order it. Um, the book, the manuscript is, as I said, pretty much complete. It's going through editing at the moment and then um, there'll be maybe minor tweaks but nothing major then on to layout I am think the plan is to have it out for Gen Con next year so August-ish uh, in so parallel it's Gen, it went, when Gen Con held next year uh, it's, it's, all, it's always first week of August so oh right okay yeah. no please go I'm wondering when, uh, where UK Games Expo fits in so it won't be ready in time for UK Games Expo in, in the, which is about uh, end of May early June I don't know. I will not okay. swear to it. Um, and I suspect no one knows uh, <laughs> because, you know, the world has entered into a period of <laughs> great uncertainty. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, that is a not understatement. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the yeah. tumultuous times of the 1930s are back. Um, <laughs> so, yes, as far as I understand, and I am but a writer. So the yeah. things of production are far above my pay grade, but the plan, I believe, is uh, middle next year. Uh, yeah. While all that's going on, I'll be writing the scenarios we did as stretch goals. There are three campaign frames in the book. There's the Armature Files, which is you're all playing professors from Miskatonic. There is Ken's um, Shadow Under Chicago, where the gimmick is that you're playing either gangsters or federal agents and Al Capone got access to the contents of um, name, Charles um, Charles Dexter Ward's ancestor, Joseph oh. Kerman's seller. Yeah. Oh. And basically you've got like, you know, uh, resurrected custodes, gangsters running around Chicago. And there's Under Unknown, Unknown Skies, which is a sort of 1930s Tales of the Loop, where basically you're playing uh, Oklahoman farmers in the small town and this mysterious corporation has moved in and is building like research stations and digging in the hills uh, nearby. Um, so, so basically, uh, th- th- there will be blood to beat Stranger Things and we're doing a scenario for that too. That sounds really cool, actually, because I do like that sort of the, you know, m- almost kind of the oddity, the, o- the oddness. Yeah, well, for that one, I wanted, a, wanted to get back to the whole sort of a scientific or science fiction-esque bits of Lovecraft, like the colour yeah. of space, the mound, which is the big inspiration for it, where basically the sky goes underground and discovers the underground civilization. Um, uh, cool air. Also, you were saying like, the whole idea of like, you know, you, you stick your characters in a Faraday cage, stick your characters in this small town in the middle of nowhere, and as part of character, of character creation and you basically create basically not you're part of this community you're not just like you know random investigators coming in you have a family in town you are the postmaster the teacher the like the um, t- town police officer or something so basically you have people to protect you also create your weird neighbors because the town's getting pretty stranger because of the weird influences and then you go off and investigate whatever the corporation is doing or whatever forces they've un- they've awoken so I have a scenario to write for that. And also one of the tiers was backers will, uh, three backers have basically paid a ridiculous amount of money uh, to come up with a scenario concept, which I'll, which I'll develop. So we look forward to that part because that is sort of like, you know, 
as I said, I love being at a convention and having unknown players. Here I've got uh, currently unknown people giving me ideas and I will then try, like, you know, filter those ideas and turn them into instant scenarios. So I'm looking forward to that right into a prompt challenge. Have you had a chance to speak to them yet about I, the... I have not, which um, I'm, I'm sure who they are. I'm sure we check. Okay. And, I mean, how many writers are involved in this project? I mean, like, it's obviously you, um, yourself, and kind of height. But, uh, do you have any more writers involved, or is it just primarily you two? Do, do uh, for the core to... book, it's just, it's just the two of us. Right. Um, there. Well, there's also um, a another book, which is, which is funded by the same... Um, Kickstarter, which is um, Boundary Darkness, which is a, I should go back to time periods, you're playing the Lunar Men in the 1600s. Ooh. The Lunar Men were a bunch of scientists and philosophers in, um, Joseph, like Josiah Wedgwood was one of them, and Erasmus Darwin. Basically, they're the, you know, the sort of like, you know, the, <laughs> the great brains of their age. They're called the Ludermen because they gather at, I think it was Darwin's house and discuss natural philosophy and so forth. Mm. And that's in partner, that's by Phil Masters. And it's partnered with a, another campaign frame for the Blue Stocking Society. By, I think is it Sarah Saltiel who's doing that? Oh, don't quote me on that. Let's check who's who's writing that part. But that, that that's also part of the Kickstarter campaign. Okay. And I mean, was my, last, my last question is like, no, when you're writing with someone, especially on a core text, yeah, how do you divvy out the work? I mean, do, and also ensure that you have the same writing style and tone. Well, I mean, Ken and I have been working together for a long time. Yeah. Um, also, like you know, I have here. Where, where do I have it? Here, the very, very, very first copy of the first edition, Ooh. which I bought at Dragon Meat back in two thousand and seven. So I sort of like you know, c- came into it as a mewling fanboy <laughs> and contributed to helping came with the second edition. Um, it also helps that um, how do how do I phrase this? Ken isn't here, so we can't do our, our our double act. But he thinks it's great where he has all the ideas and I do the, like a large chunk of the actual writing, and then he punches it up. And I think it's great because he does all has the brilliant ideas and they do the writing, and then he makes the writing better. So. In terms of effort, I feel I'm getting the better deal. He thinks he's getting the better deal. Um, so it, it, all, it all works very, very well. Um, so you, can, you sort of develop sort of like a collaborative w- relationship over time yeah. is sort of, yeah, so you can, or both play to your own strengths. Yeah, and plus, I mean, we, 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 I mean, I've not read all the books Ken has because Ken has read all the books. But uh, I, I, I can riff on his stuff and more or less keep up. Okay, and obviously you you know how each other's work. I mean, yeah. is is Ken based in America? Ken is based in Chicago. Um, yeah. When I say based in, I mean like deeply rooted in, like you know, yeah. he, uh, he will tell you that Chicago is the greatest city in the world, and he will have. Endless quotes, references, and supporting arguments to that effect. Um, but he works on Siberian hours, so he tends yeah. to like you know sleep during the day and work all night. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask like, no, how, given the time difference, how would how would that uh, influence at all? But if, if it's a no. bit of a night hawk, then not yes. at all possible. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, and well, we've been recording for about an hour now, and we could easily keep going for another hour or so easily but um i don't want to keep too much of your time because i get it's monday and it's cold so um where can listeners find out more about trailer cthulhu and back it uh the place to go to is pelgrainpress.com that's our the pelgrain press website um there will be a link to the pre-order there the backer kit is you can still look at it and see all our various stretch goals and so forth it's like backer kit at com. Um, also, we're on social medias, but basically, Google Pelgrane Press, Trailer Cthulhu, and Lou, unimaginable vistas of horror will be opened up. <laughs> okay, and where can uh, listeners find out more about you? Uh, I am garhanrahan.com, is the easiest place, or uh, or like Mythulder on all social medias, or Myth Toddler on Altar Cthulhu, apparently, but <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> But the, that the could be good if you still... do a 
if you do a series of children's books, you could call yourself Myth Toddler. I could. Um, mm. That would be an alarming right. thought. Um, Ken, <laughs> Ken has done <laughs> of crafty and children's books. We use them under his own name. Oh, nice. Okay. Oh. Uh, everyone, please go back um, to the Kaboom Second Edition. It's a great game. It's it's horror. It's it's gumshoe system. Honestly, what more could you ask for? It's a fantastic storyline, and you can tell some great stories together. So, what more could you want? I've been Peter Allison. Joining me as ever is John Joe Cosgrove. I have been here for things. Um, I'm I'm normally I'm normally here just for the laughs. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us, our special guest, Gary Hanneran. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye bye.